Vayeshev Yaakov. The Chazal tell us something that is so disturbing, that Yaakov Avinu just wanted to live in peace, and immediately, as soon as he chose to do so, Kofatz Olav Rugzay Shal Yosef, he had the trauma of Yosef's experience, which teaches us that when Sadikim want to live in peace, Hashem almost doesn't allow it. And the question is, why? Is there something fundamentally wrong with wanting to live in peace? Surely that is an ideal. And so we have to analyze and understand really what the peace is that Sadikim are looking for. It's not just simply to have an easy life. It's something greater than that, the introduction of Hashem into the world in a way that consolidates and harmonizes the conflict of this world, and that's achieved through Torah and mitzvahs and in two different ways. It's that bittel that Torah brings to the world which brings the real peace that we are looking for. And to have this deep impact on the world, sometimes you have to go into places that you never wanted to go into, like Yaakov's son had to go to Mitzrayim. Commenting on the Pasuk that says that Yaakov lived in the place of the sojourn of his father, Zamar Hazal. The Chazal teach us that because Yaakov Leishev Beshalva, Yaakov's endeavor, his aspiration was to live in tranquility. Kofatz all of Shal Yosef, and what leapt at him, jumped on him, ambushed him, <coughs> was the trauma of Yosef's experience, from which the Chazal developed. Tzadikim Vakshim Leishev Beshalva. Let Tzadikim wish to be able to live in peace. Hashem says, what are you looking for? Is it not sufficient what the tzaddikim have reserved for them in the next world, which will be amazing? They still want to live in tranquility in this world. Sounds almost like a criticism. And one of the explanations that's given is because tzaddikim don't really and shouldn't really focus on the temporary transient experience of this world. The real deal is still to come. Like the Mephoshim explained. Seeing as the world to come is like the, the palace. And this world is just the antechamber, the entrance hall, the waiting room. A person has to be consistently aware of the fact that I am just a visitor, a transit passenger here in this world. Which means that if somebody wants to live with a sense of permanence and calm in this world, then that would be somebody who seems to be more fixated on the value of the transient world than the meaningful world to come. That's the explanation. Now we have to ask ourselves, is that how Tzadikim think? It doesn't make sense for three reasons. Number one, could you possibly contemplate that Yaakov is one of our patriarchs who were vehicles for godliness without a mind of their own to rebel? Every part of their physical anatomy was so holy as to be removed from the experiences of, of this world. They were just nothing but a beautiful, perfect vehicle for expression of godliness in this world, their whole lives. And that's the Avois generally. Especially when you talk about Yaakov, who is considered the consummate patriarch. So is it feasible to imagine that Yaakov would fit into the category of what the Mephoshim say? Somebody who would, would prefer, would prioritize this world the antechamber over the palace. Can we honestly dare to say such a thing about Yaakov Avinu? Makes no sense. Number two, base. The feverish Hanal. Let's go with the explanation that we've just done, which is people who lose sight of what's truly valuable. So then it sounds like anybody who wants to live in peace in this world, that is, it's not acceptable. It's, it's not ideal. It's, it's not recommended. Now, Avol Miloshin Razal, what did the Chazal say? Is it not sufficient what the Tzadikim have waiting for them in the next world? That they still want to have peace and tranquility in this world. Now, watch the wording over there. Mashma, the wording implies. The criticism is. Are you not satisfied with what you'll have in the next world? But the Chazal did not insinuate that intrinsically to wish to live in peace is intrinsically bad. 
if you're a tzaddik who knows you have something banked for the next world, you shouldn't get distracted by this world. But fundamentally, if a person wants to live in peace, okay, no. Which indicates that immediately tells us when Yaakov wanted to live in peace in this world, what do you think? He wanted a villa at the beach? He wasn't chasing physical, bodily peace of, of being. He wanted a spiritual kind of tranquility. In fact, the kind of tranquility that Yaakov or Tzadikim generally wish for is the kind of tranquility you get in the next world, which is a world, a world that is devoid of physical experiences and pleasures. Tzadikim sit crowned by Hashem's glory, enjoying the radiance of the Shechina. That's what Yaakov wanted in his lifetime. That's his definition of a peaceful life, not a life without having to pay taxes or sit in traffic. He wanted a world of divine experience here in this world. What's wrong with that? So the pushback is to say, is it not good enough that you have that in Olam Haba? The answer to Yaakov and the Tzadikim is, but you will have that in Olam Haba. But that's where you'll have it. You'll have it in Olam Haba. And don't expect that you're going to have it necessarily in this world. Because in this world, this world is not a place to bask in divine glory. This world is a place to work with focus and with discipline and with energy. Like the expression of Chazal, which is this period that we're in, the today world, is where you work. The tomorrow world, the world to come, is where you enjoy the benefits of your investment. So in other words, we're not suggesting for a minute that Yaakov wanted to sit and sip uh, the, the strawberry daiquiris. He wanted to have a spiritual experience of divine revelation. And we said, not yet. Now, the truth is, there's a question on that too, which we are not going to deal with, which is, What exactly did Yaakov envisage? What does it look like to be in this world experiencing what is usually reserved for Elam But we're rather going to focus on this. And it doesn't seem to make sense. Everybody understands that this is a world where you have to work and produce and achieve. And not a world, a world to sit back and rest on your laurels. Yaakov knew that. Why would he have asked for that tranquility in this world? He understood that. Especially when you consider that Yaakov's dedication to Hashem was not because he was investing in some kind of beautiful spiritual return that he'd get somewhere down the line. Even to have the reward of beautiful spiritual tranquility. All Yaakov wants is whatever Hashem wants. He's a Merkava, remember? So how is it feasible to imagine that Yaakov, knowing that this is the world of doing, the world of action, should be wishing for the world of spiritual basking in holiness? And the strangest part of the story, question three, after the trauma of Yosef's abduction, Yaakov eventually re- reunites with Yosef in Mitzrayim and lives there for 70 years. His 17 best years are where? Peaceful, tranquil years here in this world. So now it doesn't make sense. <laughs> are you telling me that Sadikim are misguided? Are you telling me that they wish for something Hashem doesn't want? Are you telling me that it's wrong to want Shalva if Yaakov eventually got it? Something does not add up. Unless, of course, we don't understand what Shalva means and we don't understand what Tzadikim are looking for. On a Kudus, Habir, Bozeh, so let's explain it. Pirish, Bikish Yaakov, Levim, Shalva, Hu. When we say that Yaakov had this aspiration to live in this tranquility, Sherat, Zubin, Shalva, Loi, Ketachlis, Le'atzmo. Don't mistake it as thinking, ah, what what Yaakov wanted was that the final stage, the ultimate goal should be that tranquility. No. 
He wanted to be freed of stress and anxiety so that he could do what he's supposed to do, to serve Hashem fully. And this is quite similar to what the Rambam writes about why the great people of Judaism wished for Mashiach. What does he say? He says, they know it's not because they wanted to control the world and it's not because they wanted to have extravagant pleasures. Why do we want the time of Mashiach to be free of stress so that we can invest in Torah learning? Yaakov, same thing. He wants to serve Hashem without the distraction of all the stresses of life. Ah, so why do we say that's not a good thing to want? Why then do Chazal say it's not enough for you, Tzadikim, that you have this beautiful tranquility waiting in the next world? That's because what they want to say is at this point in time, that Yaakov is not yet at the level his, or, or at the stage of his avoida where he is ready for that kind of peace. And, and now that's not going to make sense to us until we establish, which we will, what the peace means and how Yosef's trauma actually brings him to peace. And that's why at that stage, before Yosef is kidnapped, at that stage, Yaakov can only anticipate that, please God, he'll have this amazing tranquility in the next world. Now, here's the fascinating part. Due to the fact that he went through the trauma of Yosef, most people read it as he wanted to have a peaceful life and Hashem ripped it away from him by taking his son down to Egypt. But that's not actually what it's saying. In order to achieve the objective that he had hoped for, to have the shalva, he first had to go through the dramatic experience of Yosef. And that helped him, Nisala Yaakov, that elevated Yaakov. And then, then he was in a position to enjoy that level of tranquility he had wished for. That he was able to experience a taste of Olam Haba in his own life. Which helps us to understand logically that the last 17 years of his life were living a meaningful, healthy, tranquil life. I know, which means that they were in fact years of that incredible tranquility. Why? Because he went through the Yosef experience. Now that doesn't seem to make any sense. Unless, of course, you want to say it's all relative and when you've had a terrible trauma and after life calms down and things resolve themselves, you feel a lot better. But it's deeper than that. Because in order for us to understand this, we need to understand the concept of mitzvahs, what they achieve and how we experience the so-called reward that mitzvahs bring. Because that's what we're discussing, right? Yaakov looking for the kind of rest and tranquility which is usually a reward in the next world. So let's analyze that reward because it will help us to understand what exactly he was looking for and how he got it. In order to understand that, let's have a look at the fact that when it comes to the discussion around the so-called reward for mitzvahs, it seems to be a self-contradictory discussion. Why? Because Tachris HaMechumen B'Mitzvahs He Loi La'asig Al Yodun Inyan Acher If we're honest and we really confront objectively what mitzvahs are, mitzvahs are not a means to an end. You don't do a mitzvah so that you'll get something. Like a reward. What is the objective of a mitzvah? The objective of a mitzvah is to do a mitzvah, as the expression goes, mitzvah, mitzvah. What is the reward of the mitzvah? The mitzvah. It is an end in and of itself. It's not the means to something else. Ah, so then you'll ask, why does Hashem then offer us rewards for mitzvahs? Because it's the appropriate thing to do. Why is there a reward? Because Hashem will never withhold what a person has earned or deserved. And not only a person, any creature for that matter. So because you've invested, you deserve to have something that comes your way. So is reward really reward? No. Mitzvah is valuable in itself, inherently, and therefore you do a mitzvah because it's valuable. On the one hand. On the other hand, when Hashem does give a person a reward for doing a mitzvah, long life, parnasa, health, shituchim, whatever it is, 
Ainoi inyan shayla mitzvah, that's my kol shaykhis la mitzvah. Needless to say, that reward has to have some connection to the mitzvah. It's not completely uh, abstract, it's not completely detached from the mitzvah. Elohum asuvav, veteitza min a mitzvah gufa. So if a person gets uh, as a reward for a mitzvah health or, or long life, that particular reward is a consequence of the mitzvah. Even though you don't do the mitzvah for the reward, but it's a natural consequence of the mitzvah that you get that reward. What causes, what creates, what generates the reward for a mitzvah? The mitzvah. Which is one of the reasons why if you analyze what reward is assigned to a mitzvah, it helps you to understand what the nature of that particular mitzvah is. Because the mitzvah will generate that reward, so therefore it will have a relationship with the reward that it generates. Okay, so there's the contradiction. Mitzvahs do not, we don't do a mitzvah in order to get something, yet whatever comes from the mitzvah, does add value to our lives and does create some kind of reward. So we have to understand. Why are there rewards for mitzvahs? Not because mitzvahs are designed for you to get reward, but rather because there's a side issue we have to tackle, which is the Fishena Kodesh Borchom and Kapeach Sechar Kolberia, because Hashem will not leave us empty handed. He won't remain indebted to us. He pays out in full. Now that's got nothing to do with mitzvahs. That's got to do with Hashem's decency towards us. It's not fundamental to the mitzvah. So then here's a philosophical question. Why then would a mitzvah be the cause of a reward if the reward is not part of the mitzvah? If you understand what I'm saying. Why do you do a mitzvah? To do a mitzvah. Why do you get rewarded? Because Hashem doesn't want to, so to speak, remain indebted to you. So therefore, let Hashem give you a reward that is detached from the mitzvah. Why does it have to have a relationship? So to understand that, we're going to do a similar examination of the two possible reasons about, and also very diverse reasons, as to the concept of reasoning for mitzvahs. What is the rationale for a mitzvah? So we're going to get a time mitzvahs. The same kind of two opinions or two versions of what reward is with regard to mitzvah, we'll find a similar diverse or, or two different and very different perspectives on uh, why we do mitzvahs. Why do you do a mitzvah? Ratzin Hashem Shem Mitzvah. It's what Hashem wants. Even if it's a mitzvah that is completely logical, mishpatim, or a mitzvah that can be rationalized, edos, why do you eat matzah? Because of Pesach. Still, in spite of the fact that I can understand something about the mitzvah, the reality is, why do I do a mitzvah? Because Hashem wants me to do that mitzvah, and what Hashem wants is beyond any logical explanation. That's the reality. The reality is mitzvahs are beyond logic. They're what Hashem wants because He wants them. Ah, but you look around in various places in the Torah and we're given all kinds of explanations for all kinds of mitzvahs. That is, because it is possible to bring Hashem's super rational will into the world of the rational will. In other words, it could become explainable. But on the other hand, Now this is the fascinating part. Why would Hashem do that? Surely Hashem doesn't need to explain Himself to us. Do this because I said so. Do this because it's what I want. Why does Hashem design the mitzvahs in such a way that you and I can sit down and we can understand them, we come to appreciate them? Why? Because that's part of what Hashem wants. And there's the dichotomy, the paradox. A mitzvah is beyond anything you could understand, but what does he want? He wants you to understand. Why? So let's try and explain it. Once we begin to explain this concept, it will help us understand the nature of reward, which will eventually lead us to an understanding of the difference between Torah and mitzvahs, which will help us to understand what Yaakov looked for and how he eventually got it. So the explanation is like this, Shleimus Ratzin Hashem Sheba Mitzvahs He, what does Hashem truly wish for in the fulfillment of mitzvahs? That when we 
fulfill mitzvahs bechol maimod or matzav sheyiyeh. In whatever circumstance, personal circumstance, collective circumstance we may find ourselves. What Hashem wants is that yikloit v'yachshoiv v'yachush es ha-toiva v'sateelo sheba mitzvah. The Ebesha doesn't want us running around like automated AI robots. He wants us to feel the mitzvah, to relate to the mitzvah, to have a personal connection with the mitzvah. That's why the Ebeshter created the possibility that a mitzvah could have a rational basis because then I can relate to it, then I can appreciate it, then it can talk to me, then it can, it, it, it can um, inspire me. And that's where the reward emerges from. Meaning, even if you have somebody who is spiritually immature, the Rambam describes it. At least you could think, I understand why this mitzvah is good for me. I understand because this mitzvah brings, I keep Shabbos, it brings sanity to my family. I understand that if I say a brocha before I eat food, I have mindful eating, whatever it is. I relate to it, it means something to me, and that already gives the sense of reward. I see that I'm getting benefit from it. So there's the paradox. A mitzvah is fundamentally beyond anything that I could experience and understand. And yet Hashem in His infinite greatness allows me to understand it so I can relate to it, so it could be personal to me, so I could feel rewarded by the experience. Ulam. But if you're honest, you'll, ask, you'll be able to identify this. The relationship between myself as a creation and Hashem as the creator, infinite. It's it's a, a chasm that cannot be bridged. So therefore, if you're telling me that there's this particular advantage to mitzvahs, which is, what's the benefit to mitzvahs? That it's good for me, whoever I am, at the level that I experience, at the level that I understand, which is, of course, unique to each individual. Which, by the way, the reason it could be good for you and good for the next person who's different to you is because it's fundamentally good and something which is good in truth and good in essence will obviously share goodness with all people regardless of who they are. That year, the full value of what a mitzvah really is and really adds to our life, that will only be revealed in the time of Mashiach. Because at that time, we'll be exposed to Hashem's real, super rational motivation for mitzvahs, which is beyond anything we'll ever understand, and it's beyond anything that could be given to us as, as a reward, until eventually you reach the point of the, it just about Hashem that's going to happen in Mashiach's times. We don't experience that now. We do mitzvahs now because they, re, they, they talk to us. But a tzaddik's different. When you talk about great tzaddikim, who are privileged to experience the next world while they're still alive, they're exposed to the essence of Hashem, which is the essence of the mitzvahs, even while they're in this world. When they, those great tzaddikim, fulfill mitzvahs in this world, they actually experience this immense, infinite, beyond the human capacity experience of the real pleasure that Hashem has in a mitzvah. So how could you get there? Wouldn't you like that? Wouldn't you like to have that experience? To have the pleasure of godliness unmitigated in your performance of mitzvahs? Well, there are two things that you need in order to achieve it. In order for a person to really experience the essence of Hashem's pleasure um, invested in mitzvahs, the two things you need. The first thing is complete submission of self. Which means that a person serves Hashem without any interest in any returns, including that they are not interested in having even spiritual value out of the mitzvah. The only reason you're doing a mitzvah is that's what Hashem wants, and I'm fulfilling what Hashem wants. That's the first prerequisite in order to experience the real, immense, infinite power of a mitzvah total surrender of self. Bays, the second thing required is, 
This attitude of saying, I'm serving Hashem because that's what Hashem wants rather because, than because it's what I'm going to get out of it. Yeah, boy, finish the same. It's you. I mean, this has to be real. It has to be who you are, not just what you do or what you believe. Which simply means that the person will feel Hashem's pleasure rather than their own and will be motivated by Hashem's will rather than their own when they do a mitzvah. And that we'll discover when we explore the difference between what a mitzvah achieves in terms of con connection to Hashem and what Torah achieves, which is all alluded to in the phrase we're about to learn. They're both alluded to in the Pasuk that says, Sholem Rav, there'll be great peace. There's the theme. Yaakov wanted peace. How do you get Sholem Rav? It's available to those who love your Torah Hashem. Not those who love Torah, not those who learn Torah, but those who love your Torah, Kedil Kamon, as we're about to explain. The Friedrich Rebbe comments, why is that the wording of the Pasuk, that there's great peace for those who love your Torah? Surely the better and more appropriate expression would be those who learn your Torah. Isn't that what Torah is for, for learning? So the Friedrich Rebbe explains, because if you want to achieve the real overwhelming peace through Torah, you cannot get there just by learning. What you need is love of Torah. What does that mean? We'll explain. Not only do you need love of Torah, the love of Torah is not that I love that objective uh, collection of knowledge called Torah. And those who love your Torah, which means my love is specifically to the fact that it's Hashem who gave the Torah. Okay, we need to unpack and explain this. But So we need to understand. A cost of Shalom Rav Oya Beisarsech, this passage that we've just quoted that says there's this immense peace for those who love your Torah, Muva Be Gemara is quoted in the Gemara, Keraya Lokach, to prove the following principle, which is Shatamide Chachomi Marbim Shalom Ba'ilam, that students of Torah increase the peace that exists in the world. So let's understand. Based on what we've just said, Shavur Inyan Shalom Rav Nidreshes Ahavasa Torah. We've just explained that it's not just about learning Torah. It's about loving Torah. And not just loving Torah, but loving your Torah. So the association to Hashem. So you see it clearly in the Pasuk. The Pasuk's telling us that message. You've got to love Torah. And it's got to be your Torah, Hashem. Why don't you see that in the phraseology of the Gemara? The Maimer Chazal, which is using the Pasuk to, ex to, 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 to validate it, doesn't say anything about loving Torah. It's a phrase that speaks not just simply about peace, but about increasing a tremendous peace like Sholem Rav. It just says, who generates this massive peace in the world? People who learn Torah. Who's Tamid HaChachamim? People who learn Torah. So the Pasuk is saying you have to love Torah. And the Gemara that's using that Pasuk as its proof is saying learn Torah. So which one is it? Is it learning Torah that brings peace to the world or loving Torah that brings peace to the world? Abir Bozeh. The explanation is this. The reason the Gemara quotes that specific pasuk that says there's tremendous peace for those who love your Torah. It's not just to say, oh, here's yet another proof of the principle we have just said, which is those who learn Torah increase the peace in this world. But to add another layer to the concept, meaning... Those who learn Torah, they're the amazing, amazing Torah scholars. They're part of the reality of this world. 
Because these Tamid Chachamim generate this immense peace in the world. And that then affects them. So the Tamid Chachamim are citizens of this world. Having an impact on this world. Learning Torah and pumping the value of peace into this world. And what does that do for them? Shalom Rav. Rav Afilu Be'erkam. It introduces them to a whole new experience of peace which is even beyond them. Which means that it opens a gateway for them to access a type of peace beyond the peace they put into the world. In other words, you learn Torah. What do you do? You make the world a more peaceful place. The Torah is Abrios. You bring everybody together. You create harmony in the world. And then that does for you as the practitioner, the one who's learning Torah, that now you have Shalom Rav. You have access now to a completely different dimension of peace that you couldn't even have known about, let alone have injected into the reality of this world. How, what, how, how does this work? What are these two levels that we're talking about? My very bizarre explanation is, When we talk about real peace, immense, unbridled peace, that's totally different to Practical peace. Practical peace. There was a conflict. We've resolved the conflict. Everybody's at peace now. Shalom Rav is a whole different experience. Regular peace is Whoever gave us trouble, whoever obstructed us, whoever opposed us, we've overwhelmed them. We've been victorious over them. Now they're, okay, we make peace. Okay, we're good. Shalom Rav is Elashein Mokimi Koral Mitzir Shomenagaid. The overwhelming Shalom Rav, great peace, is that the peace is such a compelling reality, you can't have an obstruction or an oppose, opposition in the first place. In other words, this is actually the source from where all real peace comes. We people, even Tamidei Chachamim, cannot create that kind of peace. That kind of peace belongs to the Ebeshter alone and specifically to the Ebeshter's essence. Because seeing as Hashem is absolutely infinite. With no restrictions or boundaries. Therefore in Hashem's reality opponents cannot exist. When you are in touch with Hashem's essence there cannot be an opponent. It's not possible. This is why the Gemara now brings phase two. Shalom Rav, which comes to those who love Torah. Which is a step beyond phase one, which is the great peace that those who study Torah bring to the world. The fact that a Talmud Chacham can bring peace to the world, can harmonize our world, which is Hisachtus Befoel Shoshnei Afochim. What does it mean bringing peace? To take opposites and synthesize them. What are the opposites? On the one hand, the world, which is a barrier to and a concealment of godliness. Velikus and godliness. They're at loggerheads. The world wants to block Hashem out. And Elikus is obviously revelation of Hashem. How do you bring them together? That you do through Limit HaTorah. But what gives you the koyach, what gives you the capacity to be able to synthesize the physical and the holy? Humitzad HaSholim Rav. That's because there's Sholem Rav in in a Sholem Lamitasa, the real Sholem, the reality that there's God and only God and nothing else but God, so therefore nothing can oppose God. No, but Torah that you find inside the Torah. Hamushreshes beatzmos, because Torah is is rooted in Hashem's essence, where there is no opposition. As we already touched on earlier, that Torah and mitzvahs are the absolute will of Hashem and the absolute pleasure of Hashem. So therefore, Tamidei Chachamim who go out and impact the world and bring peace to the world and harmonize the reality of the physical with the real reality of the holy. How do they get to do that? Because they have access to Torah, which is the real, real Shalom in the world. Because they're introducing that incredible essence of Hashem to the world, which eliminates the possibility of contradiction. That elevates them to have Sholem Rav. Rav Afilu Be'erkom, which means that they'll experience a kind of peace which is even infinitely beyond where they are from the perspective of their Torah. 
which means that not only do they get the impact or the tools of Torah, but they actually get to experience the Ratzin and the Tainug of Torah. The will of Hashem, the essence of Hashem, the desire of Hashem, which is within the Torah. Now, how do you get there? We already said before. We already said if you want to have that opportunity, you have to be completely submissive, totally surrender self, focused only on doing what Hashem wants. That's why the Gemara says over here it's not good enough to learn Torah. You have to love His Torah. The fact that they love Torah and that they are so diligent in their study, which includes the diligence to study the parts of Torah that will stimulate them to actually behave in line with the Torah. It's not because Torah is wonderful, Torah is beautiful, Torah is inspiring. But because it's your Torah, Hashem, that's what they're focused on. But we're still not absolutely clear about this because surely if we're talking about total commitment to Hashem, we should be talking about doing mitzvahs rather than learning Torah. We have identified that to say those who love your Torah means those who are dedicated to just simply do what Hashem wants. Then, you would expect then that these Tamid Chachamim, the enthusiasm and passion that they would have for doing mitzvahs would surely be greater than their passion for learning Torah. Why? Because is it not true that Hashem's ultimate goal and, and motivation, which is to have His reality expressed in this world, don't you achieve Hashem's objective primarily by doing mitzvahs because they engage the physicality of this world, which of course is much more rudimentary than the intellect of Torah. So why do we call them those who love your Torah? Emphasizing their commitment to Torah. Surely we should emphasize the commitment to mitzvahs because they want to express Hashem's purpose in this world, which is done through practical mitzvahs. So to understand that, we have to look at the fascinating insight that Alter Rebbe gives us. This is one of the revolutions of Hasidus about how Torah takes you to a deeper level of bittul submission to Hashem than even a mitzvah does. You will not be Rabbi and will understand this based on how the Alter Rebbe explains. The Alter Rebbe explains the advantage of bittul submission through Torah learning over the bittul submission of mitzvah observance. When you do a mitzvah, when you do a mitzvah, you're like a servant who gets an instruction from the king, fulfills that instruction without looking left or right, follows. To the T. But when you learn Torah, what's your experience of Bittel? This is Hashem's word. In my mouth right now, in my throat right now is Hashem's word. That's why the Gemara says, who are the royalty of the Jewish people? The, the sages. Because Because the person who learns Torah, obviously with a proper approach and attitude, He's not a servant listening to instructions from the master. Following absolutely to the T what he's told. This is so profound. The depth of Bittel through learning Torah is that you become the king. You become one with the king. Your reality is the king. You surrender yourself completely. Not like the Ebed who says, I am an Ebed who's putting my agenda aside. I'd rather be playing golf, but here I am doing what you want. You learn Torah. You become completely enveloped with and one with Hashem himself. That's why we call these great people those who love your Torah. Ah, you already identified earlier that surely the main way in which they express Hashem's will in this world is by the performance of mitzvahs. It's true. And yet we give them the accolade of loving Torah. Because these are people who are so powerful. 
These are people who are so dedicated. These are people who are so committed that when they do a mitzvah, their experience of the mitzvah is the experience that usually you can only experience through Torah, becoming one with Hashem. Kloimer. In other words, when these tzaddikim, these tamid hachamim do a mitzvah, it's not like you and I who do a mitzvah. We say, here's the instruction, and I will follow it with absolute dedication. There is no me. I'm just a vehicle. There's a mitzvah that has to be done. This is the vehicle that does the mitzvah. There's no consciousness of, I'm committing myself. Look how dedicated I am. There's a mitzvah. You push the button, the mitzvah gets done. I'm the button. To the point that their mitzvah observance becomes almost naturally automatic. As the Gemara says, Like the great sages who, when they got to Moedim, they didn't have to remind themselves to bow. It happened automatically. When you have that degree of bitter, where not only when you're learning do you feel this is God, but when you do a mitzvah, it's clearly God, and you're just the, the, the puppet. That's who gets the ultimate experience of peace, nachas, ruach, leboire, not human peace or nachas, but divine peace and nachas that you actually experience. Now, all of that is the story of Yaakov and his aspiration and the fulfillment of that aspiration. We'll understand this based on two explanations, the Maggid of Mezrich and the Alter Rebbe, who both explain the Pasuk of Ayeshev Yaakov. What exactly, in a mystical sense, did Yaakov want to achieve by, so to speak, settling in the land? And it's relevant that it's the Maggid and the Alter Rebbe because they both are connected to Yutis Kislev, which is frequently in the, in the week of Vayeshev, and when it was valuable, uh, when it was very important in their lives, it was Parshas Vayeshev. So you see the Maggid of Mezrich passed away in the week of Parshas Vayeshev on a Tuesday. And Alter Rebbe was released on Yutis Kislev also in the week of Parshas Vayeshev. So they're connected. So therefore, their commentary on this uh, pasuk of Yeshev is, is, is particularly relevant. So first, let's look at the Magid of Mezrich. Peter Sharava Magid, he'll essentially explain that this is a pasuk about mitzvahs. The Magid says, Vayeshev Yaakov Be'eretz. Yaakov dwelt in the land. V'chima hoyo le'yaakov le'ered mi madrigosa yeho ilyona me'oid ve'leishev be'eretz be'aretzius. Asked the Magid a message. Yaakov Abinu was on such a supreme level of holiness. Why did he have to go schlep down into the materialism of this world? Rekachomar. So the Pasuk explains it. Megure Aviv. Why did he go down to Be'eretz? Because of Megure Aviv. What's Megure Aviv? It's in Eloimar. Megure L'shoyna Sifo Chnisa K'moy Oger B'Kai. It's the word Megure is a word that is commonly used when you gather something up from separate pieces into a, into a storage. Pirish says the Magadam Mezrich that means K'day Le'goyv L'osef Anitzoy Tzitz HaKidoshem Anitzoyim Be'eretz Or Achnisim L'aloysem Le'elah Why does Yaakov go down into the physical world to find the holy energy centers the Nitzoy Tzitz of Kedusha gather them together and restore them to their point of origin But if you Pirish Zeh Nimzer so if you go with the explanation of the Magadam Mezrich turns out Sh'toychem HaYeshev Yaakov Eretz Meguri Aviv Hu Avoid Akshur Be'ikir Likim HaMitzvahs He's describing that the whole story of Vayeshev is a story of fulfilling mitzvahs because Eretz mitzvahs are fulfilled through things that are part and parcel of the physical world. That's the only way you can do a mitzvah. So the Magad Mezrich sees the whole Vayeshev story as a template for fulfilling mitzvahs and thereby releasing and elevating sparks of holiness in our world. The Alter Rebbe explains it with regards to Torah. Peter Rabbi Nazokim Meforesh, the Alter Rebbe explains, Megurei hu yira. That the word Megure has a dual translation. On the one hand, it comes from you're afraid. As well as an expression that refers to a storehouse. Like you find in the Lashon of the Mishnah, it's like a basket or a container filled with produce because Megure means somewhere where you gather. 
very frequently throughout Hasidus, we use the expression father to represent Chochmah, in this case, Chochmah Ilah, the supernal wisdom, the divine wisdom. So what, put them all together now. Megure Aviv, appears from Megure Aviv, who says the Altar, but what is Megure Aviv? Who Yira Ilah, it refers to a person who achieves a very profound level of awe of God. She Aviv, which becomes the conduit and the container within which you can uh, accept and you can handle Hashem's supernal wisdom. And he explains, Shabbat Megure Aviv, Koi Loyal Avedis Kema Mitzvahs, Ella al Eisekatayra. The Alter Rebbe explains that the pasuk over here is not talking about mitzvahs; it's talking specifically about learning Torah. Based on what we've already explained about that it's not just a matter of learning; it's a matter of complete submission to Hashem and acknowledging that this is Hashem's Torah, and that way you become one with the Torah. And even when you're doing mitzvahs, you're in a position that you're fulfilling uh, mitzvahs with a bitul, which is normally only experienced through Torah. So based on that explanation, we can say that the Maggid and the Alter Rebbe are not speaking about two completely independent messages. It's two complementary insights. Firstly, you have the Maggid explaining Yaakov's avoider, which was What's the practical avoider you got to do? Get into the world, engage with the physical. So that you can find and you can capture the, the sparks of holiness and elevate them to Kedusha. To which the Alter Rebbe adds, Yes, that is the avoider. You've described the what. I'm going to talk about the how. That when Yaakov Avinu went down into that world of mitzvahs, he did so with this incredible bitl that is usually reserved for Torah. So I'm going to talk about the Torah and the Siftes. So I'm going to talk about the Torah and the Siftes. So I'm going to talk about the Torah and the Siftes. So now that we've explained that the two explanations of the Magid and the al go hand in hand, it is the avoider of mitzvahs with the experience and attitude of Torah. will eventually solve for us the paradoxical uh, explanation about Yaakov wanting to live at peace and it was kind of ripped away from him until after Yosef. When the Medrash tells us that Yaakov wanted to live in peace, you and I think, well, he had so many Torahs, he just wanted to be rid of the Torahs. That's what we think. It's not that. It's not that Yaakov wanted to escape all the difficulties he had faced with his brother, with his uncle. He wanted to have the tranquility and peace that you achieve when what? When you've elevated the world to a sense of holiness. When you've taken the Egypt and you've resolved it. That's what Yaakov wants. He doesn't want to be free of anxiety. He wants a world that is cohesive with Hashem's reality. Why did he ask for it? Because he needs it. It's not a personal, selfish request. It's because that's what Hashem wants. Hashem wants a harmonized world. So now we can tie that into the explanations we've had. Firstly, of the Magid of Mezich, and then the Alter Rebbe. What the Magid says, he did. He went to the world of Esav and elevated it. He went to the world of Lavan and he elevated it. And as Alter Rebbe points out, how did he engage the world? With the absolute bitter submission that a person usually only experiences through Torah to be a total vehicle for godliness without any self vested interest. Because that is the this incredible dedication, this loving dedication to Hashem's Torah, which opens up Shonem Rav, this incredible, infinite peace in the world. 
Apikol Anal, with that in mind, Yuvan Gamatam, Lekach, we can now finally understand why he didn't initially get the shalva he was looking for. Shinyan, because Yeshev a shalva by Lemazel, Hoya by Yaakov Dafka, and why it's Yaakov of all people who wanted it. Veloi by Avram Yitzchak. Not his predecessors. That he was in the land of his father. Which implies it was Megure Aviv. That his, his father, Yitzchak, before him, was in the same space, in the same reality, but as a guest, as a foreigner. So why Yaakov not Avram and Yitzchak? Avoidas Avram Yitzchak, Kava Yamin Vasmoil. You look at Avoidas Avram, what's Avram's Avoida? Kava Yamin, love, chesed, kindness, etc. Yitzchak's Avoidas Kava Smol, Gvura, self discipline, high expectations, and so forth. They were both Hoysubiyikr Bivachinas Yehudi Milyonim Shabbat Silas. Their primary world of expression was totally spiritual. The highest realms of Atsilus. That's where they operated. That's where they affected making spiritual connections in the highest possible realm. Mashenken Yaakov Akavo Imtsoi whereas Yaakov is the central beam of all of existence, what we call Tiferes, Rachamim, Shum Avrech Min which to borrow a term from the construction of the Mishkan, it's something that that, that flies through that that breaks through from one extreme to the other extreme, from the highest of all levels all the way down to the lowest. So Yaakov, because he goes from the highest to the lowest, he could impact the lowest. That's why Yaakov is Dafka, the one who Vayeshev, he settles in this land of Megurei Aviv. Which means two things. Aleph, first of all. He's not like Yitzchak who's Mugure. He's kind of a foreigner in this physical world. He doesn't belong to this physical world. You know, he, he, he deals with Yehudim El Yonim. Yaakov Vayeshev. He settles in this world. Not like his father and grandfather. Because their primary spiritual impact was in the highest spiritual realms. So therefore their footprint in this world was, was negligible. Number two, through his avoider, which really tackles and really engages this world. He was capable of which is why he requested. He requested and wished for and hoped to be able to have that settled reality here in this world. Which means that he wanted to expose Hashem's absolute motivation and pleasure, which is Hashem's essence. That what is Hashem's ultimate motivation? What is Hashem's ultimate pleasure? Revelation of His essence in this world. So, what's Yaakov's experience? What's Yaakov's avoida? Touch the world, enter the world, engage the world, and through that, reveal Hashem's essence into the world. But he, but he couldn't do it as, as deeply and as successfully as he wanted to. Bike, she hoped to have that shalva, but he didn't have it a hundred percent. At that stage, with the, all of Yaakov's connection and all of Yaakov's investment and all of Yaakov's perspective, he did not yet reach the point of getting there. He was still hoping, looking, aspiring. Only after he goes through this incredible trauma of Yosef, only then does he actually have years of peace. Why? What, what did Yosef have or experience that Yaakov didn't? On a Sabir Bazeh, in short, the message is this. The entire experience of Yaakov's engagement with the world, he was always in a position of strength. Uh, even through all of the travails that Yaakov had in Lavan's house, Lavan never dominated him. Because look at look what happened. Lavan says to Yaakov, "What's your what's your rate? What's your charge? What's your salary?" 
He says, please, if you don't mind, go and calculate how much value you've created for me. You name your salary, etc. So Lavan doesn't dominate him. But we find a similar thing with Aesop. They eventually come face to face. Aesop melts, hugs him, wants to accompany him. So Yaakov is in the world, but with a sense of distance, with a sense of control. But when Yosef goes down to Mitzrayim, oh, it's a totally different experience. First of all, he's sold. And he's sold as a slave. And as a slave to Potiphar, who's far from a decent human. And then he's arrested. And he spends years in prison. And even when he is the viceroy of Egypt, he's only the two I see. And a Mishnah he is second in command to Paro, and he has to get permission from Paro for various things. In other words, Yosef is more embedded in the world than Yaakov ever was. So if you really want to talk about living in the materialism of Eretz, as the Magad of Mezrich said, that you're going to go down into the physicality, and that you're going to reach the deepest, darkest parts of the world and discover the diamonds that are buried there. That was achieved through Yosef much more than by Yaakov, and especially by the fact that Yosef went to Mitzrayim. Now, Yosef and Yaakov are not independent of each other. That's one continuum. Told us Yaakov Yosef, the parasha says, These are the descendants of Yaakov. Who? Yosef. I know that means she Yosef who Mamshech or maybe the Matis in Yone Yaakov. That means that Yosef is the one who translates Yaakov's concept and philosophy into reality. That is, by extension, Yaakov having a real meaningful and lasting impact on the physical world. Now that we understand this principle, that this idea of Hashem's nachas being expressed and experienced, leishe peshalva, which is the peace that Yaakov wished for, can only be achieved by engaging the physicality of this world. You have to settle in and engage with the world as mentioned from the Magid and the Alter Rebbe. That's why Yaakov, even after he had impacted and transformed Lavan and Esau, still wasn't able to do it yet because he hadn't gone deep enough into the dirt of this world. But after he goes through the trauma of Yosef, where Yosef is able to take all of that spiritual value into the worst place on earth, Mitzrayim itself. It's not geography. But primarily the fact that being in Mitzrayim means being a prisoner. Only after Yosef went into that space, succeeded in that space, transformed that space, then Yaakov has his 17 best years of his life. Because he's achieved shalva, the harmony of Hashem's essence and the deepest, darkest part of the world.